Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Welcome to the National Film Theatre and the Guardian Lecture. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce to you as our guest, the director of Cobra Verdi, Fitzcarraldo, Aguirre Roth of God, and many others, Werner Herzog. Uh, the normal format of these uh, discussions is that Vera and I would talk for a while and then I'd throw the questioning open to the audience for you to ask any questions you have of him. Werner has expressed a desire to keep uh, our chats to a minimum because he would like to have a, a, a great dialogue with, with as many people if, with, of you as possible. He has also expressed a desire that um, the ruder the questions, in fact, the better he responds. <laughs> so that's, uh, <coughs> that gives you some preparation. Um, Werner, let's, um, let's get the Klaus Kinski questions out of the way to begin with, shall we? Um, the, par the, the part he plays in Cobra Verde sets up a few echoes to me, to my mind, of uh, other films. Um, especially in the, the beginning of the film, he, uh, as the bandit, uh, he was very re reminiscent of the hunchback that he played in For a Few Dollars More. And also of another character, Antonio Das Mortes, a uh, Glaber Rock film. You've had an extraordinary collaboration, the two of you, over five films, I think. Yes. Um, to the extent that it, it becomes, it, the, Herzog and Kinski have become almost synonymous. Um, how far is Kinski, do you think, your doppelganger or your Mr. Hyde? Uh, very hard to, to answer that because, of course, it was a very intensive relationship of work. Um, I wouldn't say that he's an alter ego. To a certain extent, uh, there is a justification to that because uh, when we had trouble to shoot uh, Fitzcarraldo and we had a different actor first, Jason Robards, who fell ill, couldn't return to the set, uh, we discussed it, what, what can we do? Uh, at that moment, I said, if uh, Kinski, and we didn't know his whereabouts and his contracts and whatever other things he had to do, I said, if Kinski is not going to do it, if he's under other contracts, I'm going to play the part myself, <laughs> which uh, is not ridiculous at all. I could have done it. I, I, would, not have been, I would not have been ridiculous, and I would not have been uh, undignified. Uh, of course, I wouldn't have been as good as Kinski, but I, I would have been uh, a credible Fitzcarraldo, because the task that uh, Fitzcarraldo has to do in the film was exactly my own task. So there was not, not too far, not too much of a gap in between. Uh, Kinski now, uh, as I've worked for the last time in uh, Cobra Verde, somehow is over the cliff now, I would say. He's, uh, uh, he will age very badly, in my opinion. He will take a bad end. <laughs> I, I hate to see that. I hate to see it. Uh, because I, uh, I still think that he is some sort of a miracle of the world in the cinema. There is no one around who has his presence and his intensity on screen uh, and his force on screen. Uh, yet, I would say... The best thing for him, I, I, don't, I really don't wish him anything bad, but I only wish him to die quickly. <laughs> because, uh, because in that case, you would, you, would not see, you would not see his ugly aging. It's the same, I, I, I saw Chaplin when he was 80 years old and, and pushed out to, to the audience in Cannes at the film festival, and it was a horrifying experience. And I, I wish Chaplin had died 10 years before that. So I wish I had never seen that. And uh, I have similar feelings with Kinski. Uh, he has been more than extremely difficult, of course, and uh, it was no pleasure at all. And I said, before we started the film, I, I said to everyone in the crew, not him again. I don't want to go through that again now that I have a suspicion that he's out of control anyway, <laughs> totally out of control. So, uh, but we went through all the names of people dead, alive, uh, whomever, and there was no one around who, who could do it. So I, I finally invited Kinski. 
and uh, it was uh, the most intensive drama so far. In, in Fitzcarraldo it was different, it was more a question of perseverance. Uh, this time in Cobra Verde it was more dramatical and uh, more unpleasant than ever before. And I, I swore to God, who does not exist of course, <laughs> that uh, I would never shoot with Kinski again. Five movies are enough. Someone else who is willing to do it should step in. Uh, not me again. Uh, and there's, of course, very strong and obvious reasons for that. And, and you, can, you can start to post bets if I'm going to do it. Because I've declared I, I won't shoot with Kinski again. And I've done it twice after I've declared it. <laughs> this time, not anymore, because uh, Kinski always was, for me, a person of, of new discoveries. Uh, in Fitzcarraldo, all of a sudden, he has charm. In 220 previous films, he has never even had a smile. <laughs> so in Fitzcarraldo, in, in, in Fitzcarraldo, he's charming. Or in Wojciech, he's different. In, in Aguirre, in Nosferatu, he's each time different and has a new s segment of life for me. Now, I have nothing left to discover. I know that for certain. And this is a major reason why I'm not going to shoot with Kinski again. I would rather put myself in as, as an actor uh, in, in the next movie. If I need someone like Kinski, I'm going to do it myself. <coughs> right, well, I think that solves the Kinski problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, back to Cobra Verde itself, the film. Um, <coughs> it's dealing with uh, a, a rich and an intriguing period of history um, that, is, that is rarely covered in film. Um, yeah, never, never at all, really. Never at all. The last yeah. one that I can think of that even approximates the period is uh, Ponte Corvo's Chiamada, and I'm not even sure that that is uh, um, quite accurate. What, what aspects of, of, of the story itself, which is based on uh, the novel by Bruce Chatwin, the Viceroy of Weeder, um, appeal to you? It was uh, Bruce Chetwin's novel, of course, that intrigued me instantly. And that was uh, shortly after I finished uh, Fitzcarraldo, and I said to myself, this is a film I, I want to do. And uh, I believe that uh, Bruce Chetwin is, is the most important and best writer in English language in our, in our days. He has some sort of a touch that rarely you see in literature, uh, I'm a great admirer of, uh, of Joseph Conrad, for example, and, and Chetwin somehow has, is in the same league. And uh, the story was instantly fascinating b for me, but I, and I, I tried to get in touch with uh, Chetwin, didn't reach him. And I, I said to myself, I cannot do a monstrous project right after Fitzcarraldo. I have to lick my wounds for a few years, do some easier stuff like Where the Green Ends Dream, uh, some operas, some uh, documentary films, and so on. And uh, <coughs> I uh, met uh, Chetwin in, in Australia. He was uh, just published or, or releasing his book in, on the Australian market, and I read in the paper that he was in Australia. I found out the uh, publishing company and tried to locate him, and he was somewhere in the desert in, in central uh, Australia. And two days later, they called me and they said, if you call this number in Adelaide, within the next 20 minutes, you will reach him before he goes to the airport. So I said, uh, I, I reached him on the phone, and he was going to Sydney. I said, no, you don't go to Sydney. Come to Melbourne. I'm there. So he flew to Melbourne. He had apparently known some of my films, and he had read a, a book, uh, a prose book of Walking in Ice, which I like better than all my films anyway. Uh, and we became instant friends, and I said to him, I, I still can't do this into a movie, uh, but if in the future someone comes and wants to buy the rights, please let me know, and, and then I'll make up my mind quickly. And two years ago, uh, David Bowie's agents tried to buy the rights. Apparently, Bowie wanted to, to act and direct the movie, and his agents were the ruthless gangsters who, who never spoke about a novel, they always speak about the property, as they do in, in Hollywood. 
And uh, Chatwin called me and he said, uh, there's Bowie who wants to do it. And, and I said instantly, yes, sell the rights to them, but with a hunchback on the whole deal with me as a director on the, on the, on the back. And, uh, but, but these negotiations never ma even materialized and I, I had the feeling I have to buy it away from them as quickly as possible because n not a person like Bowie should do it. He, he's, he's not such a good singer anyway and he's a bad actor. <laughs> Uh, and and, and, and as, a, as a figure, I mean, how can he play Cobra Verde? How can he do that? He's, he's a neon light bulb. <laughs> he has the radiation of a neon light, and that's all. So I said, out with him, out with him. How much, how much did they offer? How much was it? So I, I said, I, I'm matching the offer no matter what happens. And I said to Chatwin, the story in, in The Viceroy of Widow cannot be made into a movie. It's not a movie story. God knows how I'm going to convert it into a movie. I have to, to, to invent a lot of things. I have to, uh, to narrate the, the story in a totally different way. And he said, it's fine. OK, let's, let's go ahead. And, and he, want, he never wanted to uh, get mixed up with a screenplay or so. And, and uh, he's very, very well how he kept away and how he went into things. He, he was in Africa, for example, for shooting for 10 days, even though he was still very, very ill. Um, and uh, so uh, it's very strange because it was not a movie story. Mm. Mm. And how it happened, I, I don't really know. It <coughs> probably came because I, I went to see all the locations first, and then I wrote. Yes, yes. And that has happened many times before that only from a location all of a sudden the story starts to develop. You've preempted another question of mine actually which is that uh, <clears throat> you've said that you're, you're, you're often searching for new images and um, concrete images that will express dreams and that often means landscapes. Um, not I so know in this film, not so much in this film, really? it's more, it's more uh, a whole continent or, or Africa which is the leading character in the film somehow and it's what I like about the film I personally like about the film that everything you see in Africa in the film you have not seen in the movies before uh, the kind of let's say the court rituals or, or the flag signals that, that wander across the country or, or <clears throat> the kind of dialogue all the little details and so it's a, it's a different aspect of Africa that is not so well known here, particularly not, not in the movies. In the movies you have either Africa is a, is a primitive continent full of half-savage or totally savage people, or you have uh, uh, what I don't like at all, this kind of, of Hemingway, Kilimanjaro nostalgia. And uh, the film deviates from that, of course. And uh, I, I always had the feeling that was one of the keys to, to the making of the film. Not so much uh, the image itself, but, but the, the whole structure of, of a whole continent, as mm. I see it, of course. Yeah, yes. Many of, your, many of your projects tend to generate rumors of a rather sensational nature. And uh, a Cobra Verde didn't seem to be too much of an exception in, in, in this case. Um, I, I understand from reports that uh, you had some problems with the, the Amazons who were quite uh, trained very heavily for that particular scene when they attacked the camp. But uh, they also attacked you at yeah. one stage, did they not? No, no, not. <coughs> that, that's, let's put it uh, aside as a rumor. Of course, it's not easy to, uh, to do a mass scene with Amazon warriors who had to be trained for 10 weeks in a football stadium in Accra. We had to select, out of 2,000, we selected about 1,000. Uh, of course, that is not easy. You don't have a telephone which functions. You, you hardly get any gasoline for a car or a bus or, or anything. Of course, there was a, a lot of, of logistical problems. 
the, the young women were, were very, very kind, very articulate, by the way. Mm. And of course, when something went wrong, they would instantly come and say, you did that wrong, and you uh, better look after us, and, and what, has, uh, what does this mean, and, and so on. But uh, uh, Kinski was, was much more of a problem. The Amazons, uh, the, the Amazons, of course, there, there, there were, uh, there, there were militarily trained and drilled for ten weeks, so and 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 split up in groups of twenty with a group leader for each group. But uh, of course, sometimes they went totally out of control. When we handed over, we tried when they came into uh, Elmina, our shooting location which is about a hundred miles from Accra. Uh, we, we had it organized, a bungalow for each group, and we wanted to hand over the keys to each uh, uh, group leader. But within seconds, 400 stormed the first bungalow, and they, they trampled in the doors and, and smashed the windows and jumped into the, into the place. So, or, or for example, when we distributed food on the first day on location, we said, line up, and there were these huge food pots. They lined up, but after 30 seconds, they rushed over it, and they piled up, I don't know, 12 feet high over it, and they trampled all the food over. So, and, and that was a, the source of a real problem, because on one day, the first day of shooting, we had no appropriate lists of names and presents. And I said, as long we don't pay blindly just to, to anyone, I said, we are not going to pay today. We will pay the shooting day of today and tomorrow together. And I will personally guarantee that you will get the money and I will have a chair outside of the gate of the castle of the fortress. And of course, knowing that they would storm the money instantly, <coughs> I, I only opened a small gate in this heavy, heavy wooden door in this gate. Uh, and I said to them after the shooting, please go inside the inner yard, uh, put your costumes down, deliver your costumes to the costume ladies, and then come out one after the other and you will instantly get your money because we know you have work today and yesterday. So, what happened was this, uh, 1,200 girls, and there were strong women, <laughs> tried to get at the money as the first yeah. one. And there was instantly a push against this much too narrow gate, which was only for, for one person to pass through. And it was a little bit like uh, Liverpool against Torino in the Heisel Stadium. The, the, the girls back there in the inner yard didn't even know that they were crushing the, the front girls to death. Within 60 seconds, five of them were already standing, squeezed in there and, and unconscious already. Uh, and there was absolutely no way to, to, to shout, to beat at them. They would, there was no way to, 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 to help it. Mm. Thanks God we had a lot of uh, local police around who kept uh, spectators at bay. Sometimes we had 8,000, 8, 10,000 people to keep away from our location because they wanted to storm in front of the camera and look what was going on. And I saw a man, I saw a, 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 a policeman who had a rifle. And I, I, I dragged him to, to the gate and I said, shoot, shoot, shoot. And he fired from only five feet distance into the air. And they immediately released the pressure and went inside. And then five of the girls who were already conscious dropped down. So it, it, was, it was not very polite how I resolved the thing, but thanks God there was it, it, it worked out like that. That, that was the incidence. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is not a trouble with the girl that <coughs> I had. Of course, they complained once about the payment that it was too late. I admit that it was too late, but they got it anyway. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> if I may, if I may uh, raise one of your quotes, um, you've, you've said that uh, film is not the art of scholars, but of illiterates. Um, and I'm not sure how Pasolini would have reacted to a quote like that, but how do you reconcile that with your own uh, writing as a, as, as a poet? Um, perhaps you could sort of just elucidate that statement. Poetry is, is not an academic discipline either. It's not for the, 
for the very literate people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't believe in that. I haven't written that much. I mean, in the last couple of years, yes, I, I've published about six, seven or eight books. Uh, but uh, uh, for example, of walking in ice was, was written while I was walking on foot a very long distance. And while I was walking, I, 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 I wrote, uh, when I sat down for a moment, I, I kept writing, writing, writing. And I never thought to publish it, or I never thought about poetry or style or, or anything like that. It just came physically into mm -hmm. the little pages. So it, it doesn't need reconciliation for me. Uh, of course, there, there are very highly educated poets as well. Uh, who have studied literature and uh, have all the history of, of of that trade in stored in their in their mind? I'm not one of those. Mm. Mm. Filmmaking for you, though, is um, is uh, a very physical process. It seems um, that you you physically like to engage in everything that uh, your actors and even your crew must go through. Um, for example, the, the, you went down the rapids in uh, uh, But Giri. not because I liked it. I, li I only did it because it was good for the movie. What and I was going to say, the question is, is, not, is it, is it essential I'm, I'm for not, you? No, of course not. I, I, I wish to, to direct from a chair like this and, and sit with a microphone and say, you do this and you do that and it would be wonderful. But you can't do that in, in Peru when there is no hotel, no microphone, no chair or anything. So our problem was how with uh, with uh, 20 pennies in my pocket, could I feed 450 people this day? How, how could I do that? So that, that was a daily problem, of course. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm not doing that for pleasure. I'm not a masochist. And it's, <laughs> it's very often, and, and that's one of the stupid rumors that people think, yeah, Kinski and me, or, or whatever, is always a sadomasochistic affair. It's, it's not like that, or a love-hatred yeah. affair. I don't love the man and I don't hate him. I have pity for him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, what saves a man, what saves a man uh, is that he commands a, an enormous amount, a solid, good amount of natural stupidity. And that, of course, saves him because he's so naive and he thinks it's all wonderful and he's a genius. Of course, somehow he is, but uh, uh, I, I don't do that for, for my pleasure. And I'm not looking for dangers or difficulties per se. It would be ridiculous and unprofessional. I'm, I am a professional person. That's it. Mm. And, and I, of course, physical... I can give you an example. I, I've just come from Kiev, from Soviet Union today, because I'm acting in a film of Peter Fleischmann, which is a very large project, uh, science fiction project, set up on a, some, some sort of a twin planet to the Earth, which has only reached Middle Ages so far. They have enormous sets there. It's the biggest sets that may have ever been built for, for a movie. Just unbelievably monstrous things. And I got murdered, or I was supposed to get murdered yesterday with a spear which is just jammed into my back and protrudes on the other side. And we had a stuntman, a professional stuntman, who was supposed to hit this one spot where the, where the spear would stick in some sort of a, how do you say, casket or, or, or some sort of a, uh, around my thorax, uh, yeah, there was yeah. some sort of a protection and the spear was supposed to stick in one spot in the right angle. And the guy kept missing it all the time <laughs> and, and he became timid. And, and I, I just felt nothing. Uh, there was just this timid kind of stabbing. And I said, I said to Fleischmann, the director, if, if, it, if my hair, and I had a wig on, if my hair is not just flying around me, there was nothing really... It, it was ridiculous, so I, I, I encouraged the man to be physical, to, to really stab me all the way through. And I, what I didn't know, he was an amateur boxer in the Russian national team a couple of years before, <laughs> and he really jabbed hard. <laughs> and and we, he failed and failed and failed, so it was not finished. What I want to say, <clears throat> what I want to say is this. 
In such, a, in such a moment, of course, it's not very pleasant to be, to be stabbed in the back 70 times to no avail. <laughs> it's not a pleasure of, of, at all, and I'm still quite sore of it. <laughs> <coughs> but for the sake of a movie, you, you don't have to care. After two days, it's all forgotten. Uh, it's, it's forgotten. No, nobody cares about that anymore. But it has to look convincing. It has to have real physical force until um, otherwise, you, you will not be just, just knocked off your feet. And that's the way to do movies. Mm. And the whole thing happened in a, in a long traveling shot where, 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 where people got, <coughs> got murdered all around the camera in a, in a big confusion, some sort of a palace rebellion. And, and if such a moment looks ridiculous, you can throw away the whole thing. So. Of course, it's not, not a pleasure, but, but movie has no mercy, period. And who does not understand that should not make movies. The, yes, the, the difference... <laughs> I don't know how to follow that, really. The, <clears throat> the essential, I suppose, the essential thing about your movies is that different, the, the blending of, or the blurring of the line between fiction and reality. Even though you are, many of your subjects, most of your films have been dealing with uh, an historical period, they're not contemporary, um, there is no sense of uh, fakery, there's no sense of trickery, there's no sense of the fact that we are watching um, uh, a movie that has been made in a studio. Often, time and again, you get caught up in the fact that this is, what you're seeing is absolutely real. This is obviously yeah. very important to you. Not so much for the sake of, of realism or naturalism. Mm -hmm. It's something different. Uh, a very good example is uh, uh, Fitzcarraldo, because uh, uh, Hollywood was interested in the project. For them, it was always a 25, 30 million dollars affair, but of course, uh, shooting was supposed to be done in the studios and in the botanic garden and so on. And, and we, we kept starting, we, we, we started to, to talk about the so-called plastic solution, mm -hmm. a plastic miniature boat over a plastic hill in the studios. And I always argued against the plastic solution because, number one, I knew pulling a boat of that monstrous size over a mountain would um, create um, situations that nobody had foreseen, that brought real life into a film, that you cannot, cannot even invent things going, for example, the sound of the boat. Unfortunately, it was not shot in Dolby stereo. The sound of this boat, of this uh, enormous 340 or so tons hull, was so, was so stunning and so amazing, no sound engineer could ever have invented that. Or, or many, many details came that there was real life into the film, and I, I expected that and I knew that, and it came into it. Mm. And the second and more important thing is, uh, when I sit in the theater uh, as a spectator, I, I expect and I demand from cinema certain things. Uh, for example, in a Western, I, I demand to have some sort of reassertion of my basic sense of justice. <clears throat> in other films, I demand from, from the movies a position or, or some sort of, of being taken seriously as a spectator. I want to be in a position like the early moviegoers. Who, who, who still could trust their own eyes. And the first movie performance ever was uh, Brothers Lumiere, a train coming into the station. And as reports go, whether they are true or not, uh, the first audience fled in panic because they believed the train would run over them. I, don't, I can't confirm that, maybe it's a legend. But I like this attitude very much of this audience. And I've seen people in a small village in Mexico 20 years ago who kept talking back to the bad guy on the scene in an open-air theater and one p 
pulled a gun and opened fire at him. <laughs> so, and and I, liked, I liked that very much, or the way children are, are, are seeing movies. And even the six years old kids now can tell in this science fiction movie or in this movie, it's all tricks. They know it instantly. And I want the audience back into a position where they can trust their own eyes. And, and uh, that is quite important. And, and for, for achieving that, I, I'm doing things that normally movie people would consider as, uh, as pretty wild or whatever. Mm. Mm. So you, you, you like your audience to respond as physically as you not only physically, they, I, I want them just to, I, I've become more and more a storyteller. I, I, I have a story to tell, and, and I have a good story to tell in Fitzcarraldo. And I want to tell the story, and I want the audience in a, in a position where they believe their own eyes, and where, where they see things that I have not seen in the movies before. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that makes me content if they respond to that. <coughs> Well, I've got a million more questions for you. I'm going to now, at this stage, throw it open to the audience because I'm sure that uh, there are many people out there who would like to ask Werner a question or two about his films and his work. Um, so now's your chance. If you have any questions, let's please put your hands up. Yes, the gentleman over there. In Fitzcarraldo, Fitzcarraldo finally manages to get the boat over the hill. In Cobra Verde, Cobra Verde can't manage to pull his boat into the water. Does that indicate that your vision of things has got bleaker? No. Uh, <coughs> Could everybody hear that question? <coughs> Could everybody hear the question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe that whoever asks a question from the audience should speak loud enough for everyone. <coughs> yeah, well, I have made much bleaker films before, like Even Dwarf Started Small or Kaspar Hauser is some sort of a bleak movie as well, or, or many of my films are rather bleak. <coughs> Fitzcarraldo is, has more relief in it and more charm and, and more lightweight story in it, at, at the end particularly. No, I wouldn't say so, and I, I, I'm not planning to make a, a, a film bleak or, or, or sad or gloomy or anything. Uh, it's a story that fascinates me, and, and in this incident, uh, I had a totally different ending uh, for the film, for a scene in the screenplay. And I, from the point of literature, it looks very convincing. Very, very good. And, and people ask me, why do you want to deviate? And I said, for this and that reason, I don't want to go into detail. It will not function on the screen. I'm not content. I don't know how to finish the film. So I had the feeling that this scene with a boat being pulled into the ocean could be the end of the film, or, or almost the end, because I had planned that he's totally exhausted and staggers into the interior of the continent in search of snow. And of course, we, we know he had heard that there is a mountain, a very high, high mountain, somewhere in the interior of the continent, which had snow on its top. And he tries to find the snow. And he would stagger away in exhaustion into the interior of the continent and, and of course, perish. <clears throat> and we set up the scene with a cripple who follows him. We had this boat in the, in the beach. And nobody at that moment knew it was the last scene. Neither Kinski knew it nor I knew it. And this is one of the moments that I really like about Kinski. And it's very mysterious how it functions. Kinski pulled the boat to, to such an exhaustion that while he was almost at the end of going away into the interior of the continent, he decided to die. Somehow, he, he felt like dying. And he knew, he knew I would not turn off the camera. He knew it. He knew it somehow. And I, watching him, knew it was not the end of the scene yet. It was not the end. Something still... And I sensed it before, and I loaded the camera with a... With a four-minute reel with a whole reel of film. Even though the, the, the shot that we had never rehearsed was supposed to take about 60 seconds. So it's four times that long now, almost only with one single cut. And, and somehow both of us sensed 
it was going to continue and it would be the last scene and I, he, he knew I would not turn off the cameras. And it's very, very strange because it's totally non-verbal how we understand each other. And, and he had total confidence I would keep the camera on him until he was dead, or supposed to be dead. And it was not planned, it, it just materialized somehow, and it's, it's like a gift of God falling into my lap. And, and I have been lucky a couple of times in my life, and, and uh, I always care very much for, for good beginnings or for good ending shots or ending sequences in my movies. And, and f in my opinion, that is the strongest. That is the strongest. Unplanned. Yes. Or I can give you another ending in, <coughs> in Kaspar Hauser with, uh, with a scribe. Uh, he was a man, an, an extra who was supposed to be uh, there for shooting only for one day. I liked him so much that I said to him, uh, Herr Scheitz, can you stay a little bit longer? I want to have you tomorrow. I can incorporate you in the scene. He said, yes, Herr Herzog, I can be there. And, and I said, you will be the weasel tomorrow and you will echo and you will write. So and he, he became bigger and bigger in the film, and I liked him so much that uh, on the last day of shooting, we actually shot the last scene. And I said to him, Herr Scheitz, I want you to have the last word in the film. And he said, Herr Herzog, what is it going to be? <laughs> and I said, Herr Scheitz, I do not know, but I will write it <laughs> overnight. So <clears throat> things happen like that. I do not think so much about it. Uh, of course, I had to invent something overnight because the cameras were there and Herr Scheitz was still there. <laughs> so I had to do it. He hands over his, his hard hat to the coachman and carries it away and he walks behind the coach and has the last lines in the film. So uh, I don't plan to make a bleak ending or this or that ending. Sometimes uh, it's, it just... Uh, falls into my lap. What about the ending, just to sort of talk about endings and continue that for a moment, the ending of Nosferatu, where Jonathan Harker rides across that? Uh, that was well Is planned. It, that, that seemed in to that me case, as a... That was well planned, but um, <clears throat> I liked the sky a lot, which uh, didn't look so good. In, uh, it, it was shot uh, on the coast, on the Dutch coast. And I always had the feeling I, I, should, um, I should change the whole image by uh, superimposing uh, clouds which were, which were shot before that. I had that shot before. Uh, the clouds were moving 200 times their speed. And, I, and the clouds, of course, were, were protruding into the, into the altitude. And I turned them downwards. They are protruding downwards now mm -hmm. in this shot. And there was strong wind which blew the sand on this beach. Uh, yeah, I like it quite a lot. Yes, yes. Yes, audience, another question. There's gentleman yes, over there. Yeah. Um, you mentioned your book, Walking on Ice, and you're quoted as... Um, Can you speak a little louder, please? Yeah. I'll just yeah. repeat that question yes. for the rest of the audience. The, 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 ba the, the basis of the question is, uh, um, with Lottie Eisner's example, um, does Werner have any plans to encourage future filmmakers through s schools or, mm -hmm. or, or investment or whatever? Yeah. Uh, first part of your question about Lotte Eisner, uh, of course she has been very charismatic and she has been the only real stronghold outside who instantly recognized that there was something going on in German cinema again. Of course, 
uh, probably you know as your moviegoers or, or more intimate in your knowledge about film history, she had to flee Germany in 1933. She was one of the most intimate collaborators of Henri Langlois at the Cinémathèque Française. And she wrote on Expressionist cinema in particular. The Haunted Screen is, is one of the finest book, books, uh, or probably the single most uh, interesting book on uh, German Expressionist cinema. Uh, she is so important for, for the younger generation of, of German filmmakers because she somehow of course gave us courage and, and she gave us something uh, that I can call legitimacy. Uh, it's not only the films and the subjects and the style and the renaissance of German cinema which uh, per se uh, of course was some sort of a, of a new event but after the barbarism of the Third Reich in Germany and after the catastrophe of the Second World War she was the person who, who gave us legitimacy. <coughs> I don't want to elaborate much more into that. Of course, she was very charismatic. Uh, everyone who, who ever met her admired her. She, she always gave courage to, 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 any, to, to everyone who came to her. And at one moment when, after many years of filmmaking and no echo at all to my films, Aguirre was mentioned before, it was a film that for years had not been accepted by any distributor at all, nowhere, and was totally put down by the German press and so on. And, uh, and, and she gave me courage for the next, for just for 10 years somehow. I, I, I was finished, I was, <coughs> I was at my end. <coughs> Sorry. And I said to her, I, it, it can't continue like that. As a painter, you may. You may go for 10 years and paint and you have no echo. In, in movies, you, you will be destroyed because it's so much money involved. And she, she just took a sip of coffee and she, she said, uh, listen, uh, film history does not allow you to quit. And she took the next sip of coffee and, and that somehow carried me for 10 years. So it was just that casual kind of thing she, she would do. And. Uh, I personally, I, I don't know, I, I don't have the authority that this woman had. I'm, I'm working hard and, uh, well, as long as I can be a hope for, for, for other filmmakers, it's, it's quite all right. I don't want to, I don't want to, to be a, a nuisance, I don't want to be an embarrassment. If I, if I have that feeling, of course, I, I will step out of this instantly and filmmakers quickly become clowns of their own profession. And that has happened to many, many, many of them, and, and even the strongest have, have had that, that kind of fate. Uh, yes, uh, I, I believe that many of the filmmakers nowadays need some courage to, 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 do, to do things that, that normally are not being done. And, and to be courageous enough to, to show adequate uh, images for, for, for our state of civilization, to, to just to be bold enough. I, I don't see that too often. Of course, there are many bold people around, but, but not enough. I wish there were more. And as, as long as I can be some sort of courage, encouragement to, to anyone, fine, but I don't know if, if I am. I, I, I just try to... I, I try to do my work as, as good as I can, that's all. Yes, uh, yeah, yes, the, lady over there. <coughs> the lady over there, to start. Please, yeah. You talked quite a lot about the importance for you of sense of physical reality when you're making a film. The sound of the actual boat, for example. Yeah.
somehow completely poetic and completely dislocating. And the end scene, where there is another form of communication between the cripple and Kinsky. <coughs> Yes, <clears throat> physical reality is, uh, is, is, is not for the sake of realism on the screen. We have to make a very clear distinction. Uh, when I speak of physical reality, I mean uh, that something is alive on the screen. Of course, uh, a film like uh, Aguirre, The Wrath of God, has enormous physical realities in it and yet it's constantly transformed into some irreal things like the, the rainforest, the jungle, uh, transforms slowly and gradually into some sort of a fever dream of the, of, of the jungle. It's not real jungle anymore, it's some sort of, of a fever. And, uh, and yet, of course, the jungle was there physically. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not one of those who, who wants to make realistic movies. And, and, and I'm glad that, that movies are existing. For, for that little money, we can step so far out of reality as hardly in, in, in any other event, maybe with the exception of opera. And that's why I like opera. In, in recent years, I've, I've gone, gone into opera a little bit. And that is exactly that kind of, of imaginary world and physical reality, again, is not, is not encountered during the shooting for the sake of realism. I, I don't like realism. And even in my documentaries, you don't see much of realism. It, it is very stylized uh, to such an extent that uh, for the sake of a, of a deeper strata of, of truth, I would even tell you a lie in order to reach that. Very good example is uh, uh, Land of Silence and Darkness. A woman who is deaf and blind at the same time. She, you can only communicate with her through a tactile alphabet. And uh, in the beginning of the film, she speaks about a ski jumper that he had, she had seen in her childhood when she was still able to see and to hear and how these faces were in total ecstasy and fear. And she says, I wish you could see that as well. And of course, I cut and I show the ski jumpers because I like to show them. And she had never seen that. Everyone who is into cinema verite would say, ah, yes, he's telling lies. Of course, I'm telling lie, a lie, but for the sake of a deeper dimension of truth. And, and that is being achieved in this film. And, and all my documentaries, like uh, The Great Ecstasy of the Sculpture Stein or many others, very clearly that film, show that I do not care for, reali for realism. Even, even in my documentaries, I don't care so much about it. So. I don't know what the next things are going to be. I, I will be more of an actor now in next time and I, I will do smaller things now this year because I, I still have to, to recover from, from Cobra Verde. So I'm still licking my wounds for, for a while and I do smaller stuff. A documentary in the Southern Sahara and a film on French people and I have to go back to this opera in Bayreuth that's, which I did last year and I'm going to act in two films. In the next one, in the Swiss film, I will be a murderer, sexually disturbed, very dangerous. <laughs> <coughs> we will see. <laughs> so, I, I, I really do not know what, what, is, what is coming next and, and which will be the, the development of, of what I will do. I, I have become more of a, of a storyteller and it interests me more to tell a story than to show a beautiful image. 
Does that mean, actually, since you've progressed to that stage, and we'll go back to the questions in a second, I just want to follow that up, that you, would, you will be unlikely to repeat the kind of experiment that you made in Heart of Glass, um, in which... With hypnotized the, actors. With hypnotized actors. I mean, it's difficult to see how far you can go beyond that. I suppose the next stage would be to hypnotize the audience. But I have done that, by the way. Have you? <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I, I can, and I can tell you why. Because uh, under hypnosis, uh, certain elements of the human mind function much better, like memory, uh, your ability to to memorize uh, a, po a poem, for example, would be much higher than in a different state, like being awake. And uh, fantasy in most of the people under, under hypnosis is highly activated. I had uh, one test done with uh, 25 or so potential actors for the film who were under hypnosis, but so deep under hypnosis that they would open their eyes without waking up. And I. I suggested to them that they were uh, the most incredible inventor and they had invented a machinery that was so extraordinary that nobody before had ever thought of inventing such a thing. And I said, I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder, you will open your eyes and you will describe this machine. And there was such unbelievable inventions. It was extraordinary or people would, would be very poetical. I, I told them, you are on a, on a strange jungle island, never seen before. For, for hundreds of years, no people have been there. And there was a holy monk on this island who had lived there all his life as the last one. And there is a huge mile-wide cliff, all of emerald. And all his life, this monk spent with a chisel and a hammer to inscribe one poem into this huge cliff of emerald and I said you are discovering this place and you will read this poem to me so the first one who opened his eyes he said I can't I can't read it properly I, I, I forgot my glasses I said put your glasses on so and, and, and he was a man who uh, who uh, took care of horses in a stable for police of a police squadron and he read he started to read with a very strange voice uh, why can't we drink the moon? Why is there no vessel to hold it? And so on. Really very beautiful. And I had the feeling that vision, and we know very little about vision, was extraordinarily activated under hypnosis. And I had a whole movie audience, no, not, not too many, about 110 or so, under hypnosis, and I showed films like Fata Morgana to them, also uh, Aguirre, The Wrath of God. I stopped it very soon because uh, uh, reactions were so different and, and it's very hard to keep an eye in this semi-darkness on, on each one because some, some people were afraid of Aguirre and, and they started to, to hide from this face and I, of course I stopped the, the screening because of one person who, who got afraid. So uh, it has certain uh, it, it goes into, into a borderline of, of risks which should not be uh, stepped beyond and I stopped the whole thing and uh, I still believe that with more precise, with more precise program and aim of, of, and more precise purpose, it should continue and we could learn a lot but it should be with much less people, much fewer people and with a more precise uh, target mm -hmm. of research, then it, it would be all right. Otherwise, I, I, would not, I would not advise to do it. But of course, in, in the film, uh, uh, what's the title, Heart of Glass, I had the idea to have a prologue and an epilogue to the film where I would appear on the screen and I would explain to the audience from the screen that all the actors were under hypnosis and it was possible to hypnotize an audience from the screen. And I would explain whoever was willing to see the film under hypnosis should open the eyes and follow my suggestions. Those who did not want should not listen to my advice anymore. And of course at the end of the film <clears throat> I would appear again 
and wake everyone who was under hypnosis slowly up into the state of awareness, of full awareness. Of course, I did not do it. It is possible, though. You can even hypnotize someone, somebody over the telephone, I think, or over a TV set. Uh, of course, not to such a high percentage. Out of, let's say, 100 persons who are willing to be hypnotized from the screen, I would say only, a, only 20% 20 persons might be hypnotized, not more. And of course, not those who are not willing to be hypnotized. You have to be cooperative. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course that is nonsense and it would be much, it, it would have a tendency of a circus effect and, and it's not advisable and not right to do that. But again, I think we can learn a lot uh, from that and I'm quite willing to go into anything like that it doesn't have to be hypnosis, anything else, whatever comes up, for the sake of a film. Yeah. I don't know yet what, what it okay. might be. There's a gentleman here who's been very patiently waiting to ask his question. Please, sir. Uh, yeah. um, so, uh, your film Nosferatu, alongside the original, uh, a short while ago, uh, it occurred to me that some of the uh, event titles on the original film had worked their way into your uh, your version of it into the dialogue. And it occurred to me um, that a lot of your films that I've seen have a lot of long passages without dialogue. Would it be courageous for you now to make a completely silent film with just music and images? A little bit like Fata Morgana, only music and images. I don't see it at, at the moment. I, I only uh, have one thing I, I'd like to do uh, in Australia with, uh, with an Aborigine whom I, whom I met, but probably by, by now he's dead already. He was a very old man, ailing in the hospital. He was the last and only surviving uh, person of his, of his tribe and of his language group. So he had nobody with whom he could speak anymore. Nobody on earth speaks this language anymore. And I tried to make a film with a camera for one hour on him and, and some voice from outside trying to establish some sort of a contact with him. It's maybe the only thing, but, but I, I don't, I can't predict it, I don't know. It is possible, it's, it doesn't need much courage to make a, a, a silent movie, but uh, I do not believe that this is going to be the tendency for the next time to come because uh, I'm much more in storytelling. I'm much, I, I, I wish to do a film like uh, Treasure of Sierra Madre one day, then I would finish, I would stop, you would, see, you would not see me anymore if I <laughs> achieve that one. I don't you need to. Uh, yeah, you should you should try to to avoid to squeeze me into the into the position of of the poet of the cinema or, so, or such kind of things. That lady over there had a similar tendency to advise me. I should I should be more I should be rather be a poet. I want to be a soccer player. <coughs> <coughs> or, or better though, rugby. <laughs> yeah. Yes, on the back there. With whom? I did not understand. Uh, he wanted to know about your uh, work in Beirut yeah, in and your relationship with Wolfgang Wagner. Uh, Wolfgang Wagner, sorry, yes. I did not understand you acoustically. Uh, I have I've done one opera before. Uh, I have to mention that because I'm not an opera goer. I had seen but two operas as a spectator. So that was my only qualification. And I liked the work in, in Bologna, where I did Dr. Faust by Busoni. I liked it very, very much. I really liked it a lot. And I had, 
I had a lot of, uh, of offers to do opera. I could have ended my days by, by being an opera director after Bologna. One of the offers was by Wolfgang Wagner, who sent a, a telegram to my office asking whether I was interested to do lawn green. I said no. <coughs> and then he advised me, he asked, uh, I, I had a phone conversation, he asked me, have you ever heard the opera? I said no. And he said, would you please listen to a record that I'm going to send you? So I did. And when I heard the overture, I was totally stunned. And I knew this was, this was just a lightning that hit me. This was something very, very big. And, and I had the feeling I should have the courage and tackle that one. So, uh, and I said to Wagner, listen, he's, he's, he's like a peasant and I like to, to talk to him that way. I said to him, Herr Wagner, let's just do the, do the overture and then keep the curtain closed. And when people uh, start to, to make noise and demand the opera, we play it again and then we chase them out. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, you, you must listen to the overture. It's, it's one of the most extraordinary pieces of music ever, ever composed. And uh, I must say, I like this work very much. Uh, uh, Bayreuth has, has, is a highly ritualized ambience, and, and, and somehow you, you, you cannot change the, the, uh, the rituals and, and the kind of um, pilgrimage that, that people are doing to this sacred hill. I, I even tried to, to, to make some sort of statement about it. I wanted to have the, the set uh, around even into the landscape with huge megalithic uh, sacred sites, a little bit like Stonehenge, even around the opera house, which continues on stage. And then some sort of a line by a laser beam for eight miles across the valley into the... Um, they didn't allow us that thing <laughs> after all, but it was too expensive and so on. But, but still, uh, it, it is quite different work and I, I had, you, you just have seen uh, an, an excerpt of Burden of Dreams. Of course, uh, it is a necessity that I do other things as well, that I step out of, of being a movie maker and I do other things. I'm in cooking. I want to be a professional cook. I, I want to work in a restaurant at night for a year or so. I, I, I do photography now, but with a, with a very old-fashioned camera with plates and bellows and the black cloth over my head. And, and all the portraits, strangely enough, with this dignified craft, all the portraits are, are dignified, strangely, as, as, as the early photographers of uh, last century. Or I do operas, or I, I walk on foot. I, I still have an unfinished footwalk, of long, really a long one, that I have to finish. It's, it's unfinished, and I want to walk on foot. Uh, so I, I try to avoid the cinema for once in a while. Or well, I'm acting now, which is, which is a different attitude towards, a, a different approach towards movies. So Bayreuth has been very pleasant. Very strange, very, very strange, but uh, uh, things, things went well. Of course, I got my beating by, by the press as usual in Germany and in some other papers, but that's okay. <coughs> yes. You mentioned yeah. dreams yet again. Uh, something which comes up very often in both the conversation and everything said about your films. May I ask, are your, are, when a lot of your films seem to be about dreamers, are they dreams of your own? Or uh, no, I do not dream at all. Okay. I have, well, I, I'm one of those who does not dream at night. I, I, yeah, I mean the psychology uh, is is just uh, is just a scandal. The whole the whole profession, the whole discipline is a scandal, and and these bastards <laughs> maintain that every person dreams so and so much time during the night, and I am the living proof that it is not that that, that it is not like that. I do not dream. I, I really don't dream. I, I do I do so maybe once a year or so. And and it's very prosaic. I my last dream was that I had a sandwich. 
<laughs> for lunch. So, but, and, and, and maybe, sorry, I, I want to add something serious, but it's true, I mean, I, ha I had a sandwich for lunch, but maybe because when I wake up in the morning, I, I have a deficit. Like some people who do not sleep long enough, they, you sense it. You have not, today for example, I have a, an enormous deficit of sleep. I haven't slept very well the last nights, and I had to drink a lot of vodka last night until I fell out of my shoes. <laughs> but when I wake up in the morning, I have the feeling there is a deficit of dreaming. Again, God damn it, again, why haven't I dreamt? And maybe, maybe that pushes me a little bit into making films. Many of your films seem to be about dreamers, Aguirre and Fitzgerald, yeah. that they're dreamers. Are they dreams particular to a character who exists only on the screen or in the film? Or are they dreams that you think you can share? And just, just by way of just having seen the, your latest film, is there a dream which informs Cobra Verde? Because it seems to me almost that there isn't. I, can't, I couldn't see a dream of No, not, not, that, not to my knowledge, but uh, I think... Uh, Cinema in general should encourage uh, everyone in the audience to a certain degree to, to, to uh, take their own dreams seriously and to, uh, to have the courage somehow, even, even if, if most of the time it will end in failure, but at least to attempt to live some of their dreams. And, and if Fitzcarraldo gives you courage to that, uh, the film has achieved something at least. And, and I, in, in that film, definitely, I, I, I try that. And, and whoever, uh, whoever has seen other of my films who are not so explicit in, in, in this point, I would say, if I can give courage to, to your own dreams, then my existence has, makes some sort of a sense. I mean, it doesn't make much sense anyway, but it makes some sort of a sense. Yes, right on the back there. Yes. It is an element of the story. Uh, maybe it goes very quickly, and, and uh, you are not the only one who has, who has asked me about it. In the dialogue, of course, Cobra Verde receives a, a letter warning him, don't come to the palace of the king, it will be your certain death. So he looks quickly for an excuse, and as he's a merchant of slaves at the coast, he says to, uh, to the minister of the king, tell your majesty I cannot come because always one of my feet has to remain in the sea. I don't know how well it was translated in the subtitles. He, he, he means he has to, 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 to remain at the coast. And they take it literally and put a calabash with, uh, with uh, sea water on his foot and carry him all the way into the interior of the country. So that's the meaning of it, period. very, very simply. Okay. Yes, there. Uh, I've been in, uh, in Australia and Perth at a small film festival uh, many years ago and I came, uh, by coincidence, I read in the newspaper about uh, the first real big legal confrontation between black aborigines and a mining company in the northwestern area of, uh, um, of Australia. And um, some or, or much of the story goes back to this real uh, legal case, which, uh, by the way, the uh, Aborigines lost. But of course, in the long run, it was uh, it was the first real political victory for them because there was an enormous wave of solidarity uh, for them, uh, particularly by by urban intellectuals, by university people, and then by the media later on and and. Uh, this uh, trial had a lot of effect. 
in the whole thinking. And of course, the story is invented with the aeroplane and the, and the place where the green ants dream. That, that is basically invention. And um, I, I wanted to do this film before Fitzcarraldo, and I had everything prepared. I had very good locations, and I had a, an unbelievable uh, old man who, whom I had seen in two documentaries by an Australian filmmaker, Michael Edals. One of them is, is a very, very beautiful film called Lullaby Dreamtime. And a very wise, charismatic old man. And um, two months before shooting uh, was supposed to commence, he died. And I said to myself, there's no way to, to, to do this film without this man. I, I will drop this project and I will never touch it again. After Fitzcarraldo, after these years of, of, of toil, Still, this project kept uh, somehow moving in my head, and uh, I, kept, I couldn't get rid of it. So I, I said to my friends, I, I'm going to Australia again, and maybe I'm lucky and I will find someone. As a matter of fact, I ended up with three uh, Aborigines now. The three major Aborigines are some sort of, a, uh, of this one person, Sam Wulagucha, who died. It's split, this figure now is split up in three different personalities. So, th of course, there was a lot of change because of the death of the uh, first man who, who was supposed to play the part. But <clears throat> it had a strange history, the, the whole film. Hi. Yes, sir. Um, I would like to know, <coughs> how can I be convinced by a Brazilian bar name, well, bar Barman, yeah. that speaks in German and is very badly dubbed, right? Not even a six-year-old can be convinced by him to say he's not talking German, right? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so why make the these play I mean, in German? Yeah. I mean, was it deliberate? Because it's very obvious. Yes, uh, this, uh, this young man, of course, not only that he was uh, physically somehow deformed, he had a speech defect and had very hard time to articulate and with a great effort he would articulate. Of course, dubbing into any language, and I knew that beforehand, would, would, be, would be very difficult, almost impossible. Uh, of course, I, I prefer to have his original voice. He, in this instance, spoke Spanish, by the way. I personally prefer to have subtitles and, and have him in this original, but uh, the problem is that distributors and, and movie theaters would not like to show the film in such a version. It would be too much of a selective audience only that you can reach with a, with a subtitled films. You have a very, very special type of audience and you will reach a few thousand and, and you can do that you can do that as long as, as your film hasn't cost, cost that much. If, if your budget stays at a very low limit, then you can say, OK, let's forget about the larger sections of the audience who would see that. But you have only 10% maybe of the potential audience. And it's, it's, a, it's a consideration of the market. And uh, I agreed to do it. Uh, uh, in, in a dubbed version, because uh, as in all my films, I, I am my own producer. And since 20 years, I would not have made a film anymore if I had stuck just to subtitled versions of my films. I would have been finished as a producer. And who, for God's sake, is going to produce my films? No one. <laughs> They've not shown up yet. <laughs> We have time for one last question, so we'd like a quick one, please. I'll take the one up there. Yeah. Yes. Many of your films have been made in very remote locations and involved considerable contact with indigenous peoples. Um, you have been accused of uh, being somewhat heavy handed with them um, or disrespecting their social and economic uh, position. Can you say that louder and can you say that once more? Disrespectful of what? Or of whom?
say about where the green areas agree, you have a very strong uh, sense of their own cause. How do you um, feel about any contradictions that there are in the production process of actually working with indigenous peoples and the messages that you're trying to put across in your film? Uh, well, would you, would you consider uh, the Ghanese people also as indigenous people? And yeah. do, you, do you want to say with that, or do you want to hint with that, that they were abused or, or misled, not paid, uh, socially mistreated and physically tortured? <laughs> uh, what, what? I'm really referring to various uh, comments that have been made in the press around yes. the Yes, but that is not my problem. Sorry. The press in Fitzcarraldo is not my problem. It is a problem of the media. And, and it went totally wild. The media in, in let's go to Fitzcarraldo because that was the worst. For, for more than two years, I was completely uh, criminalized by the international press. The British press was, was rather harmless in comparison to what the Germans did to me. And I was accused, and I mean, <clears throat> literally I was accused of forcing uh, native Indians of the rainforest uh, who had barely ever had any contact with white civilization with uh, uh, force of weapons into slave labor for my film and on and on and on <coughs> and that I had that I had put resisting people uh, uh, through military uh, people in, into prisons and so on and I can only say and there was a, a tribunal against me, and I don't know what else. I can only say very much in general. I, I asked very urgently Amnesty International to go into details of that and to send a commission to Peru, which they did. They came back with a, with a detailed, a, a very, very detailed report. <coughs> and, and this report was never mentioned in not one single line by any of the press. And, and of course, I've never put anyone in jail. I've never forced anyone into slave labor or, or anything like that. This is just media's, media craziness. And, and it went on into real wild things. For example, there were reports that Claudia Cardinale was hit by a truck. And, and, and dying in the hospital. And I got the phone calls from all over the world what was going on with her. And I learned from that because the first one I answered, not only that she, she was hit by a truck, the, the barefoot half uh, Indian truck driver raped her. <laughs> and, 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 and you can only fight a rumor by rumor, not by the truth. So that's, that's a way to deal with the press. And these skunks of the press, have, have, uh, have really made, made it very hard for me. I, I was attacked in the streets. People came running and kicked me just really hard. And, and I, I've gone through many, many things. And, and as true as I'm sitting here, I, or, or let me put it differently, I'm not in possession of truth. No one on earth is. But I have been a witness there. And I have been the one who, who was responsible for things. And my collaboration with the, with the native Indians in, in Peru was very, very intimate and very good. I can give you one example. Uh, shooting was interrupted for five months until we could do the last uh, two weeks of shooting. And uh, we had 950 native Indians in our camp. They had to be uh, gathered from, from various areas. When we returned for the last fortnight of shooting, 4,000 people wanted to come. So they, they wouldn't do that if, if I forced them with, uh, uh, with guns into, into slave labor. And uh, of course, there was, there was a lot of, uh, of accusations that I didn't pay them well enough. All these people got paid twice as much as they would earn in the best kind of job that they could get in Peru. That is number one. And number two, I always said a film like this cannot be cannot be uh, f cannot function only in ca in terms of cash money. They have to have uh, an exchange of services. 
and in this area where we shot, uh, a native community had the trouble of, of intruding lumbermen who wanted to chop down all, all the forest around them. Uh, and I said to them, for example, let, let me try, I'm a guest in your country, but I know how to deal with bureaucracy in Lima. And I spoke, we, we had, and, and for having a claim for a territory, uh, for having a land, land title for that, first of all, you, you need a land surveyor to measure uh, and, 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 and things and, and have a map. So we had a land surveyor in there. We went for two and a half years, we battled this with attorneys uh, in, um, with the Ministry of Agriculture, which is responsible for the Reforma Agraria. And I, I, I personally spoke to the Peruvian president and I had two of the representatives of the village with me. And um, it uh, was not over after, the, after we had left. It took another two years and now they have their land title. Uh, and and I, I have really struggled for, for that. And, and of course nobody reports about that. And, and the press is, is interested in the, in the scandal and in, in, in some sort of a big story. And uh, my only defense is just working, working on. And from the films that you can see that I have made, uh, it is hard to imagine that, that it was done by somebody who, who has put uh, people into jail just to force his way through and make the film. I'm not one of those. As true as I'm sitting here, and if you don't believe, we we can go out into the street and <laughs> fight it out, if you prefer that. <laughs> On that physical uh, way. But uh, uh, I have no proof but, uh, but my physical body here. On and that, uh, as I'm sitting here, I've, I've, I'm not a criminal. I'm only a criminal as an actor now. I will be a murderer in the film, but not in real life. On that very positive and, uh, 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 note, uh, I'll, I'll draw the evening to a close. Thank you very much indeed for coming, and thank you, Mr. Werner Herzog, for being with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you.